if you attended any of mine before, sorry, same two questions. First question to think about, why become a teacher? Honestly, the reason why, I mean, of course, you're gonna think about it because, you know, teaching is wonderful, valuable, meaningful, but you're gonna have tough days, right? And so on those tough days, the answers to this question is what's gonna sustain you. But I do have practical reasons why I have you think about this question. One is that you're gonna to wanna to be able to articulate this in an interview. It's the last part of the application process. And it's that you'll meet with two, call, uh, two faculty members and they'll chat with you, have a discussion, but it's really, they get happy when they see the excitement for somebody wanting to be a teacher. So kind of bring that through. And then the other reason is that you're going to um, need to submit a statement of purpose, which is just a fancy name for essay. It's in the application and you'll get a prompt but it's always fun to you know, answer the prompt, but maybe pull in some of the, the reasons why you want to be a teacher. These are some of the, the answers that our former teacher candidates gave for why they want to become a teacher. And um, teacher candidate is what you'll be called if you're in the GTEP program. It took me a while to figure that out. I'm like, who are you talking about? But if you're in the GTEP program, they don't call you a student. They say that they'll call you a teacher candidate. Okay, so you're thinking about that question. Here's the next question to think about. Why PSC? Now, I'm hoping and thinking that you're looking at other institutions because it really isn't about PSU or any other institution. It's about you and where you're going to be successful. However, this is my opportunity to talk about PSU, so I'm going to take it. So PSU, the Public State University, urban setting. I don't know if you've been downtown lately or on the campus, but it's gorgeous. It's in the middle of, it's kind of in the middle of downtown. It looks like a park running through it. It's really part of our identity being downtown. But what's lovely about our university setting is that we have traditional students, so students who live on campus who are starting freshman year. But we have many, many uh, master degree programs, graduate programs, and we also, because we're downtown, we have a lot of community members on the campus. So you do get a feeling that you're on a university campus, but you also feel like you're part of life, you know, especially a lot of commuters and things like that. So it's, it's a very cool setting. Um, cohort model. So a cohort is when you're moving together through the program together. So let's say we admitted 100 people to GTEP secondary. We would have four cohorts of 25 and you would move through the program with the other 24 students. And what's nice about that is that you have an automatic support network. But one, one thing also to think about is it's really an automatic career network because everybody around you, they're all working towards becoming educators. And you might also have people in your class that work in educational settings already. So they might already work in a district that you're interested in. So they can speak to their experience working with you. So um, our program, the GTEP program is designed to be a face-to-face -face model. Right now, uh, it's, they're still you know, offering remote instruction. I believe that the goal is to be back face-to-face -face in um, winter term. But of course, we're gonna respond to however, you know, safety. So, but for right now, it's designed to do face-to-face. -face. And I know people have said, well, I really want online learning because I'm busy and things. But the truth is they see a lot of, they see the value in seeing teaching modeled. And our students feel prepared when they're done. You know, sometimes when you're learning and you're trying to learn and you're doing things online, but then when you're out there and you're, you're doing student teaching and you're in the classrooms, but it does feel a little more supportive when you're in the classroom. They're already doing presentations and projects with all those students and being able to, to talk with them for support. So it's it's really, our students really feel supported and know what they're doing when they're heading into their student teaching. You're going to do your student teaching in public schools. And I know that's like, okay, but it is important. It really is. And I, I realize how important it is um, since doing this job because I get, I get a lot of people who come back to PSU. They did their student teaching in another through another institution, like in a private school. And you know what? It's valuable and meaningful and great. It's not, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that some students have said, well, I really want to get a job in a public school and I'm sending out resumes, but I don't, I don't feel like I made connections. So they come back and they do get added endorsements through PSU because 
they do their student teaching in the, in the, in the public schools and they can make some connections. We'll talk about endorsements in just a second. Um, focus on equity and social justice. And you'll see that reflected in the program of study, but if you know PSU, then you'll know that that's a really huge focus for the university as well. And then our faculty are former public school teachers. Another piece on here is that our um, university is a research university. And what that means to you is that you have a lot of active research going on in the College of Education itself. Uh, visual impaired learner, we have a lot of active research on early intervention, special education. So as you're going through school, you might find that there are areas of interest that maybe you want to expand your scholarship and you want to to, to you know, as you're reading maybe publications of our faculty, connect with them and see if there's things that you can learn to expand your knowledge and, and areas. It's kind of cool to have people with their finger on the pulse of change going on in education. Okay, why you teach your YPSU? Let's talk about that. All right, so I'm gonna start from the very beginning before talking about this page because you know, I've been working in higher education for a long time, and I worked with associate degrees and bachelor's degrees and master's degrees, and those all made sense. <laughs> and then when I started working with licensure programs or teacher preparation programs with embedded masters, I was like, my head blew, blew up and I was like, I don't understand. So I'm going to tell you how it landed on me, right? So if it helps one person, I'll be here. In order for you to be a teacher in the public school in the state of Oregon, you need to have a teaching license. And where you actually get your teaching license, you don't get your teaching license from PSU. You get it from Teacher Standards and Practices Commission. We always call it TSPC. You, that you get your license from TSPC. TSPC is the licensing board that sets the proficiency for the state uh, teachers in the state of Oregon. But in order to get that license from TSPC, you have, to, you have to complete what they call a teacher preparation program that's approved by TSPC. So this is one of them, is the GTEP program. So if you're looking at different universities, and it doesn't matter if they're called MAT, GTEP, all these different names, most likely they are TSPC approved teacher preparation programs made up of academic coursework and student teaching. When you complete a teacher preparation program, wherever you completed that program, that institution will then recommend you for licensure. Okay, Steve completed this successfully, give him a license. So let's talk about a license, but what is all of that? What you're going towards is you're going towards your preliminary teaching license. And all that means is that you don't have a license yet. It's a teaching license, but everybody starts off with a preliminary teaching license. So here's my visual. <laughs> I almost can't say this without doing these visuals because I've been doing it for so long. But this is your teaching license, okay? And then this is an endorsement. An endorsement is your area of authorization for which you could teach. So those are the difference. So you're going towards a preliminary teaching license with a secondary endorsement. A secondary endorsement requires a content area. So remember when you were in elementary school, you had one teacher that taught all subjects, but when you're in middle school and high school, you always had a teacher per subject. And maybe you might have you the might same have teacher that teaches teacher social studies, but they also teach language arts, right? That's because they have a preliminary, they have their license and they had a social studies endorsement and a, a language arts endorsement. So you can get added endorsements. So right when you're looking at this program, you're working towards a preliminary teaching license and your secondary content area endorsement, one or two, depending on what you're looking for. Okay, so now when we look at this program, 45 credits, 21 credits of student teaching. If you said to me, if all of you turned around and said, you know what, Laura, I decided that I don't want to be a licensed teacher, but I want to get my master's degree. I want to get a master's in education, but I don't want a license. We have other programs and you could do, let's say our master's in ed curriculum instruction. That program is 45 credits of academic coursework and you'll have an internship or um, a project or a thesis. And when you complete that, you earn a master's degree. Now let's pivot back to this program. The way that you could think about it is, you are basically working on a master's degree right here. Funny enough, you get to use these courses in the teacher preparation program towards the master's degree. So this plus 21 credits of student teaching means you earned a master's degree in education, but you also completed the approved teacher preparation program for licensure. 
I say it in this way because probably the hardest part of my job is when somebody tells me that they already have a master's degree or a PhD or you know, some higher learning and they're like, I want to, I want the fast track to license. I don't want another master's. And I have to say, guess what? It's 66 credits. We're going to give you a master's anyway because you're double dipping courses that you have to take. And I say this is that if you decide not to do this program now or wait a couple of years, remember that so that you don't go and get a master's online and come back and have to do a full 66 credits. So that's how the teacher preparation program is this is the teacher preparation 66. So I'm going to stop for a minute and have, do you need any clarification or any questions on what I've said so far? Because I'll keep on talking, but I'll want to stop. We're all good? Okay. Okay. So this, the GTEP program is offered in a one-year program of study and a two-year program of study. The one-year program of study, it's, it's pretty accelerated. I know that one year sounds like a long time, but it goes fast. You're going to have to clear your schedule because you won't be working. <laughs> so right here, because we start every um, term, I mean, every year, we start it in the summer. It starts in June. And you can see it's pretty packed. I don't want you to be too intimidated by all of these courses because summer term at PSU is a little bit different. Summer term at PSU is broken up into chunks. So you could, in theory, take these two classes for two, four weeks and then these for the next four weeks. So don't be too intimidated. You won't be taking them all at the same time. But there's one credit of field experience. And then boom, you won't get your first break until September and then fall term. You're really busy with 14 hours a week student teaching. Winter term, Winter now term, you're doing 20 hours a week, student teaching, fewer um, credits in, in coursework. And then boom, in your spring term, you are the full-time student teacher. So it's pretty fast. Remember, um, I said that we, you would be the co-people in your life. I'm the front door to the GTEP program. Once you're in the program, you're just waving at me through the window because nobody lets me in. But you'll be in your cohort, right? So when you're in your cohort, you're, let's say all of you are in the same cohort, you're moving through the program together, you will have a cohort leader. That person kind of acts like your academic advisor acted, okay? And um, that will be your go-to person, right? And then you will also have a field placement coordinator that you're working with. So right here. This is the person that's going to help you with your field placement so you don't have to go and try to find that yourself. Somebody else is going to help you with that. When you're doing your student teaching experiences, you will have a cooperating teacher. So you're in their classroom and you'll have a university supervisor. So you're never really alone. You always have somebody at, this, at, at all the stages. Right now you're at the front door with me. And then there's also somebody who's in charge of the full GTEP secondary. Her name is Gail. So there's always different people that you're talking with, right? So remember, I say you're moving through the program in a cohort. So as you're going through this program, there's a time where you are going to separate from your, um, move apart from your cohort, and that's right here, the methods. So this is where they teach you how to teach your subject. So this is why we do want the students to have a knowledge of the subject of teaching, because that's what pulls GTEP apart from other programs, is that we have content area experts that are teaching you teaching methods, of course, but you also are going to have people that they're going to teach you how to teach that subject, and that's where you'll do it right here. So that's the one-year program of study. Now, not everybody can do full-time, so they'll have have, uh, we also offer a two-year part-time program, and it looks like this. So the, so the difference in this program, besides being two years, is that the courses in this program start at 4.30 p.m. or later, and then you're going to notice that there isn't any student teaching in the first year. There is student teaching in the second year. So remember, you also want to set aside some Saturdays as well. So 4.30 p.m. or later on Saturdays. It's a really great program if you're working in an educational setting because oftentimes people go work and then come right to our, our um, classes. 
So now, remember I said there's no student teaching in the first year. In the second year, if you do have like a typical nine to four job or something in that area, you're gonna to have to have some flexibility because a student teaching is gonna take place when school's in session. So you're gonna to have to have some flexibility there. And then you're gonna note that on the last spring, the spring of the second year, we'll have full-time student teaching. So you'll have to take a leave of absence or you're gonna resign because you're about to become a teacher. So then you wanna keep that in mind. Same amount of credits. Any questions about the programs of study? Awesome, I'm either really boring or I'm nailing well, I do have a question. <laughs> okay. What do most people do the one-year program or the two-year? What's the majority consensus? And then I have questions about matriculation or how many people you actually accept. Sure, so I more people do the one-year program. So oftentimes if there's five cohorts, or uh, there would usually be three one-year full-time and two part-time. Cohorts. Yeah, cohorts. Okay, so you guys admit about 125 or 150? Somewhere? Yeah, somewhere about 125, 150. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So then when you were asking about um, acceptance, I will, I like to describe this program as more selective than it is competitive. I mean, it can get competitive and it has in the past where, you know, we have a lot of people that apply to the program. But if you are a good teacher candidate, if you are a strong, I should say, a strong teacher candidate, they're more likely to make room for one more person than to have you elbowed out by somebody else. So it really is, they look at your application holistically and we'll go through the application process. Um, but for the most part, it, it, it depends on, it depends. But for the most part, we usually get, we've had people that, that we've had more applications than some room and sometimes they get on a waiting list, but I would call it more selective. So let's talk about getting into the program. So we require that our students have a deep knowledge of the subject that they're teaching. And how we measure that mastery is two ways. In the courses that they've taken in the past and a test. So let's talk about the, the, the courses that you've taken. So these are the different subject areas that you have to choose from. The world languages, if you're looking at teaching like Spanish, French, German, that's where you go in the world languages. If you're teaching mathematics, you can do foundation, foundation or advanced. But let's let's take a gander at some of the, the coursework. So, for example, let's look at um, let's look at social studies. That's always kind of the one that a lot of people are interested in. So we'll look at social science right here. This is the content area. Courses. So if a student, what a student will do, this is what I tell every student who's even considering GTEP, the teacher preparation program. The first thing that you'd want to do is reach out to the content area advisor because our expertise is in teaching and we do have content area experts that teach these subjects or the methodology of the subjects. But we partner with content area advisors in the different departments at PSU, so social studies, language arts, biology, right? And what they do is they're gonna take a look at your unofficial transcripts and provide what we call a departmental recommendation form. That is going to be one of the requirements listed in um, the application. So the department, you're getting a department recommendation. So let's say you reached out to Kate Constable and you say, Kate, I'm interested in doing a GTEP program, social studies. Here's a copy of my transcripts. Kate does it a little different. I think Kate might give you a, a Google form where you'll list all your courses and kind of put them against these courses. And then Kate will let you know, either give you your departmental recommendation form or let you know, hey, I'm going to be I'll, I'll provide the departmental recommendation form. I'm assessing you as well prepared for GTEP. And that when you apply, that's you're gonna upload that form. On that form, there are there's an area that says highly recommended and recommended. 
What that means what that is that they're going to recommend a course. Work. If it's highly recommended, it's recommended you take. The recommended is, you know, recommended. So let's say, let's say um, a student has a couple classes that they need and they, they're missing a few classes. Then you might be recommended that, you know, you're, you're adequately prepared to start GTEP, but I recommend that you take these two history classes and then you can take them. And you can take them at the community college too. But that's what you'll want to do is that you want to reach out, sorry, to your content area advisor, which is listed on the bottom of this, of that page. It's on our website. It is a little wonky to, to, um, to find, but what I'll do is I will send you this slot, these slides, and you will be able to go into this prerequisite link and click here and find your subject and look for your, your um, content area requirements. The, the GPA, the standard GPA for GTEP is 3.0. That's the one they're looking for. But to let you know, so let's say you had a 3.0, but you had some Ds in, the, in your, your um, transcript. It's okay, but they do like you to have the B minus in the classes, in your, your prerequisite classes. They'd like you to have that. So if you're gonna teach math, don't fail all your math classes and have A's in all these other classes. They'd want you to have at least a B minus or better in, your, in the classes that you wanna teach. Um, I asked, I reached out to somebody saying like, if they don't, if they have one, C, is it going to hurt? And some people say, no, it, it should be fine. But if there's more, a whole bunch, then there's there's maybe a different issue there. So make sure that you reach out to me with questions. And what I tell students all the time, the last slide on this, on, um, or the last slide on this presentation is my contact information where you can click right into my calendar and make an appointment one-on-one. -on -one. And I always end up meeting with people because we talk about their their journey into uh, becoming a licensed teacher. So if you do that one year program of study, the, the full time, you're gonna wanna have all of your prerequisite courses completed before you start the program. If you do the two year program, then you can do up to two prerequisite courses. I would say reach out to the content area advisor soon if you're looking at starting this coming June. Are, is anyone here looking at starting this June? Awesome. Awesome, awesome. So you would look because we still have um, winter and spring to take classes if you need to take classes, if you want to take classes at the community college, you'll have time to do that if you want to do the one year full-time program. So it's good to reach out to the content area advisor. So remember how I mentioned- PSU, PSU. Pardon me? Can you take them at PSU if they're available? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, if you've already had your degree and you're not a PSU student, you can apply as either a post -bac student or a non-degree seeking student, which is an application fill out, and then that way you're um, you just sign up for the classes. But if you're if you are already currently working on a degree, then you can maybe talk with your advisor about adding some of those courses to your program. So remember how I mentioned. It's the your mastery is measured two ways in the courses that you've taken and then also in a test. Let's look at that. So this is called an NES content area test. I'm going to send you, like I said, these slides will have this, but even if you're like, I can't remember, just put in content test for Oregon and you'll, it'll come up, right? So what? let's take a look at this. So what you'll do is you'll find your subject and you will click on your subject and then you will look for, you know, test availability, check set availability. And I think they give you different locations to take it. So here's the thing you wanna do. Click on prepare. This prepare will give you options to, to purchase study guides, practice tests and things, because honestly, a lot of times people are coming back to being a teacher because they might find out like, you know, hey, I'm a natural educator. I've always wanted to be a teacher, but you know, you haven't been taking classes lately. So it's good to prep. Even people who just graduated from college, um, I'm like, do the preparation. Go in there feeling really confident. All right. Any questions on the NES content test? So you will see right here where it says June. 
in your application, there's a space for you to upload your, your scores. I'm going to end up telling you about the due date, which is February 1st. So you're, it's going to be like, okay, February 1st, it says this is due June. What you'll do is if you take the test prior to submitting your application, you could submit your scores in the application and boom, it's done. If you have not yet taken the test, and there's going to be some people who have not yet taken the test because um, they're probably going to inquire about this program a quarter before the due date, right? So they haven't taken the test yet. What you will do is upload something that says, I'm taking my test in May, or I'm taking my test in April, or something like that, so that we know. It's just so long as you upload something in there, because that score, the scores aren't due till June. Somebody asked me, does it hurt my application if I don't have my test scores in my application? And it does, it absolutely does not hurt your application or your chances. But I will tell you, it could help your application because if you're submitting an application with past test scores, that's awesome, right? So let's say you get um, the departmental recommendation form that says that you need to take one class, but you're like, look at my test. So we can those tests, but you don't have to have them right away. All right, let's move to the next one, admissions. Any questions before I move on to admissions? So the February is uh, the application for the GTAP, correct? Mm -hmm. have, have this done before that, okay. Yeah, so let me see. I'm going to do, I think it's, I, I should move these slides just to, for you to remember that the, the application is open. So we're accepting applications for GTEP. The application due date is February 1st. And um, people ask me, is it a hard deadline? <laughs> I'd lie for two years in a row because, you know, with pandemic, we lent a little grace, so we kept it open a month. And the year before, there was an institution that closed, so we also lent grace. So then it wasn't February 1st. So then now I'm going to say it this way. It's a preferred deadline, February 1st. I will say that the scholarship deadline is usually a hard deadline. I know that we've had a, we've, um, we kind of uh, extended our opening for the applications for the scholarship. I think we're now, the scholarship portal will open in the middle of November. So who knows if the scholarship deadline will change, but once this closes, it's hard, you can't get in, even if you're banging on the door. So just keep note of February 1st is a, is a good day to remember for, for application deadlines. Okay, so let's talk about the, application. So there's a couple things that happen. You're going to be applying to the GTEP program. The College of Education, the admissions committee in the College of Education is going to look at your application and consider you for a teacher candidate, as a teacher candidate. What happens is at the end of the application process with the College of Education, they'll have a list of people that they're, they want to admit to the program and be teacher candidates, and they will send that list to our graduate admissions office, basically saying, please admit these people. And graduate admissions has the final say, because what graduate admissions does is that they look at your, your GPA and they make sure that you have a bachelor degree, and if that checks out, then they'll get a letter saying you're admitted to the GTEP program. So this is what the application looks like. You will go online, and you will um, upload your unofficial transcripts. You will eventually send your official transcripts to PSU because that's we're going to be waiting for those. But for this purpose of this application for our faculty and, and admissions committee, they just need to see your unofficial transcripts. Um, and they're looking for, this is a standard 3.0 GPA. Now, if you don't have a 3.0 GPA, does that mean that it's a dead deal? No, no, not necessarily. In this application, it's going to be looked at holistically, right? And so what I tell students, even though I'm making this part up a little bit, but let's pretend that everything is worth 20 points. So you apply your applying to GTEP and your you don't have a 3.0, then maybe you don't get the 20 points. However, 
your statement of purpose is on point. You get the full points. And then you have these really strong recommendations and you get the points. They'll look at it holistically in that way. So it doesn't necessarily mean you won't get in. What they, there's two GPA um, pieces. We would like a 3.0 for the College of Education. The graduate school, this is where, remember I said that they do the final check, do you have a degree and then do you meet the GPA? The GPA to be admitted as a graduate student, there is one that you cannot be below a 2.5, I believe. A 2.75 is that you're admitted by regular conditions as a grad student, 2.75 or higher. If you are, if you have below a 2.75, you would probably need a petition or a, you know, um, some support from the College of Education saying we'd like you to admit the student. If it's below a 2.5, then it wouldn't meet the graduate um, application standards. So what can a stu student do besides taking a bunch of classes to raise their GPA? This is what you can do. And this is what many students do. A lot of times when we're doing our undergraduate, we're different people when we're doing our undergraduate degree, right? So if you did nine graduate credits, right, which usually equates to about three graduate, three credit graduate classes, if you did nine graduate credits, your GPA, if you got 3.0 in each of those, would be at least a B minimum in each of those classes, 3.0 in each of those classes, that GPA would supersede your whole undergraduate GPA. So keep in mind. So then you'll upload your unofficial form, your, I'm sorry, your departmental recommendation form. And if you don't have one yet, you just say, hey, it's coming. I, I, I'm waiting it from the advisor, the NES test scores. You could say, hey, I'm taking the test in April, or you upload your scores. Resume. This is what you want to do. You, we suggest that students do what they call a functional resume versus a chronological resume. So the functional resume allows you to group all of your skills and experiences together because the truth is they're scanning your resume looking for your experience working with youth. So if you had, you let's say five years ago, you were a coach and you were tutoring two years ago, and then you used to, you know, you're working with this boys and girls club or whatever, you can group it all together because that's what they're looking for. They're wanting to see your experience with you. If you don't have experience with you, right, then there is still time. There's a lot of places that will, um, that you can reach out to. There's people that are students that are struggling with online learning, virtual learning. If you are coaching, if you're help, just if you know a teacher, ask if you can come into a classroom or just get some experience. The reason why they have that is because managing a classroom is so different than managing your neighbor's kids, right? And some people will say, well, you know what? I taught in community college or I did training and development for my company, so I know I'm an educator. You know what? That counts. That's great. That does show that you've been, um, you know, you can do instruction. However, in the community college, people are paying to be in your class, and in work, they're getting paid to be in class. But in in high school, you're gonna have people who don't want to be in your class. <laughs> so it's kind of kind of go ahead. Steve. So if we got some volunteer work, say right away, then we would have maybe two or three months showing that. You were volunteering because I don't. I, I was a, a community college teacher. And I was a doctor. So they were young. They were 18 year old to 25, you know. But I don't have, you know, high school experience. I just don't. So. But you know what, Steve? That is valid. You're right. They're 18 years old. So you can, you can put that down. That's, that is, um, I mean, that's very valid. It's more like sometimes I have had people who, maybe taught like a class in community college, but then really have they, especially elementary, <laughs> they're looking at elementary and it's so different, but yours is at least middle school, high school. So you're closer than if somebody wanted to be an elementary teacher because it's gonna be a little bit different, but um, that's fine. Even if you, even if you volunteer, let's say you went and 
you were working, let's, I'm just going to make this up, like, like, hey, I'm just going to go and help pack food for the for food bank. Oh, I'm going to be working with youth to help them. You know, I mean, it doesn't matter, just add, you know, you're going to be able to skip to your experience when you're in your interview, but this is just a way to have it in your resume to put it together. But, you know, your experience working in the community college with young people, that's what you're going to, that's how you're going to, uh, you know, focus on, on your experience working with young students. I'm also, uh, I have an interview to be an emergency substitute teacher here in Portland School District. Would that count or would it be better to be a volunteer? Because I've also tried to become a volunteer one too. No, that's perfect. No, that's great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, I mean, honestly, during the pandemic, I had, everybody had been waiting for the summer to do, you know, because they're in school or they're doing things and then they were going to volunteer with clubs and then the pandemic happened and no one was able to meet with anybody in person. And they were like helping a neighbor, like putting together little pods of teaching. They're doing whatever. And you know what? It just, it's really hard these days. So the fact that you have what you're saying you have this group sounds cool. So. All right. So then statement of purpose, that's a fancy name for essay. And you will have a prompt. You want to know the biggest mistake that people make in their application is they don't answer the prompt on their essay. They write these really beautiful, well-written essays and talking about how they came to want to be a teacher and they don't answer the prompt. And so if you're getting points, let's say we're doing my 20 point thing I was saying, you're not going to get your points because you don't, you might have a really beautiful essay, but you didn't answer the prompt. So answer the prompt, stay within the word count. So if they say 500 words, do not do 2000 words. They don't care if it's single space or double space or where you put your name. Just answer the prompt, do spell check, have somebody read it, stay within the word count. That's probably one of the biggest mistakes is they write, like, especially if they're applying to different schools, and then they use the same um, essay. Well, if the essay answers prompt, then that's okay, but oftentimes you tell it's this generic teaching essay. All right, so statement of purpose. And then the last one is the three recommendations. So you do not have to chase down a recommendation letter. What you're going to do is you're going to add three names and email addresses of people providing recommendations, right? And then as soon as you do that, if let's say that's the last part of your application, you could submit it. You do not have to wait till the recommendations come back before you submit it. Just put the name and the email address. I would let them know that you're putting their name and email address because they'll get, sometimes their email goes right to spam. So you'll let them know I put your name down so they should get it right away. Another another um, suggestion is to let them know that they might be contacted twice because you can use the same recommenders for your scholarship application. And the reason why you do it twice is if you were just applying for the scholarships through the College of Education, we already have the recommendations. But if you want to be considered for scholarships outside of um, the College of Education, then they'll want recommenders. So just put just tell your recommenders that you're going to put them down twice. And that way you don't have to go and get more people. But what, like, who should you choose? You could pick someone who can speak their experience working with youth. So um, that's a great one. If you are, and you don't, you don't have somebody ask me, do I have to get one of everyone? No, these are your, um, just some examples. You can have somebody who's been working, maybe somebody who can speak to your professional demeanor. If you're a student, a PSU, at PSU or a student, in, especially in a class that you're wanting to teach and that, that professor knows that you want to teach that class, good, that's a good person and somebody can speak to your academic capacity. Um, the work with youth is a really strong one because they know that you know to be an educator. So this is your application. So what happens is when you're done with this at February 1st, now we're back to this slide. February 1st is the preferred deadline. So you submit your application anywhere from now to February 1st. Around February, the middle of February, you'll get invited to an interview, and then that interview takes place around the end of February. Then at the end of February, the admissions committee will get together, do a final review, and send their list of teacher candidates to graduate admissions, and you will know, this is when you see decisions, this is when you'll know, mid-March, if your name was on that list. And basically, and basically then, then uh, 
uh, graduate admissions does that final thing. It's kind of like, hey, you got the job, so long as your background check checks out. <laughs> it's just they're just going to make sure you have your bachelor's degree and and that you have the minimum GPA for uh, the graduates. Any questions? Any questions? I talk fast and I talk a lot, so tell me to slow down. So let's talk a little bit about financial aid and scholarships. So I'm not a financial aid advisor. However, I do have some, some good resources for you. You are going to fill out your FAFSA, which stands for, remember acronyms, Free Application for Federal Student Aid. And you're actually going to fill out two FAFSA applications. The reason being is that our program starts in the summer, and the summer term falls under one application and then fall the other. So you're going to fill out two, which is good because it gives you more access to aid if you need it. So if you need more than that, or I should say that if you like supplemental funding outside of the 20500 right, then um, you can apply for the graduate plus And then scholarships. So do you notice this is bold, February 1st, hard deadline. So if you click here, it'll take you to our scholarship page, and it'll probably say applications will open mid-November. So that's the scholarship. And then this is just some resources for you. I'm just glad just doing this thing for. But we do have uh, financial aid advisors if you have any questions. We also have something called the Financial Wellness Center, which I understand the students program. love. And that's like sometimes students are like, how is that going to work? What is payment? How is that going to be for me financially as a you know um, grad student? Or how do I incorporate my other loans? Or all those things. Our Financial Wellness um, Center is really good about helping students kind of, kind of stay on track and find a way to do those. All right, additional options. So I put this down here because oftentimes when people are thinking about becoming teachers, they think, oh, I could be an elementary, middle school, or high school teacher. But we actually have a lot of different programs. This is just a couple of programs that we have. If you were on, if you were on our website, you would see, like on our programs, you would see those added elementary, added secondary, add spend, all those added endorsements. Those are programs for students or teachers who already have their license and their endorsement who want to add areas of authorization. So if you're an elementary teacher, you want to add a reading endorsement, or you want to add a special education endorsement, you can do that. We also, if you decide that special education is really where you want to be, you can get your preliminary teaching license and get your first endorsement in special education. Special edu education endorsement is a K-12 endorsement. So this endorsement, when you get this, you can actually be a special education in kindergarten through high school, or you could actually do 21 years of age. We also have added uh, added 